Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Willoughby, and I am the Dean of the Edwards School of Business at the University of Saskatchewan and a friend of Gordon and Maureen Haddocks. I acknowledge that as we meet here today, we are assembling on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reform our relationship one with another. I am delighted to be here today to introduce Gordon and Maureen Haddock. I've known them for years. In my role as a professor in the School of Business, and now my role as Dean of the Edwards School of Business. An entrepreneur is somebody who accepts the challenges given to them and rises above those challenges. What better environment to be an entrepreneur than in today's current pandemic circumstances? And I applaud all of those young entrepreneurs who've entered this competition, who've demonstrated their ability to be resilient, to try new things, and to achieve success. Today, we're going to hear from Gord and Maureen, who as friends of the School of Business, are tremendous examples of success. It is said that a person who gives money gives some. A person who gives time gives more. But the person or persons who give all give everything. And Gordon and Maureen have given of themselves. They've demonstrated through word and deed what it means to be an entrepreneur. Gordon is an alumnus of the College of Commerce. Maureen is an alumna from the College of Education. They are truly great examples of giving of self to help the community become better. I welcome Gordon and Maureen Haddock, friends of the Edwards School of Business, the namesakes for the Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series, and the originators of Get a Bigger Wagon, Gordon and Maureen. Thanks, Dean. And welcome, everybody. Wow, what a year it's been, and what a different presentation format we have moved to for our 14th annual Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. The COVID-19 challenge and the limitations of group size have forced us to move from a packed audience venue at the Edwards School of Business to the magic of a virtual presentation with only 30 people in attendance. I don't think anyone will ever forget this year and the effect it had on every business, every, every teaching and learning experience, and every family and friendship relationship. It has not been fun, but it has made us stronger and made us grateful for where we live. My entrepreneurial friends and I often talk about how successful we would be if we were not born into a great country like Canada, a country where opportunity and success is based on hard work and perseverance, a country where education is available to all. We wonder what it would be like to leave your homeland and move to a new country and start a new business not knowing the people, the local business environment, or how we would be accepted into a new community. Our next guest speaker, Percy Hoff, did all of this. He grew up in the 1970s during the darkest days of South Africa's apartheid era. He faced racial oppression, fought to get an apprenticeship in diesel fuel injection, then started a diesel fuel injection company, and even though his business flourished, he sought a better life for his family, and he came to Canada in the early 1980s. He left South Africa, where the average winter temperature is 17 degrees Celsius, and ended up in Saskatoon, the winter hotspot of Canada where he started Saskatoon Diesel, a successful rebuilder and remanufacturer of diesel fuel injection components. His business journey is filled with both ups and downs, as you will hear, but his love of soccer and his need to give back to the community fueled his drive to develop soccer in his new home. He created the Valley Soccer Association led the Hollandis International Soccer Club as technical director, coached the U of S soccer teams, the provincial teams, and the Canada game teams. He started 
soccer camps and a retail soccer store and continues to be involved with soccer to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Percy Hoff. Hello and uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Percy Hoff. Um, I am uh, a married man living in Saskatoon. I own a business in Saskatoon, and I'm married to my wonderful spouse called Yvonne. We have uh, three children, two of whom survive, uh, and uh, we have eight grandchildren, uh, two boys and uh, six girls. Um, my wife Yvonne worked in, our, in my businesses earlier on, uh, but she's retired and at home at the moment. Uh, my son Percy Jr. Uh, is an MBA and a CEO of Sherpa Software in town here, and he lives just outside Saskatoon. He has four girls, uh, one of whom has just started first year university. Um, my daughter Jill uh, teaches in Kuwait. She's been there for quite a long time, and she has uh, two boys and a girl. Um, all of them are, are uh, fluent in both Arabic and English. Uh, I want to introduce you to my family. Uh, on the top of the picture is my mom and dad. My, mom's na my dad's name was Percy and my mom Sybil. And I was born uh, just north of a town called Durban on the, south, on the southeast uh, coast of South Africa. Uh, my home was actually where you see Swaziland up at the top. That's Mozambique in white next to it. And uh, I was born in a town almost at that border, probably about 40 miles from the border. On the right-hand side, you'll see my dad and my uncle Herbert. Uh, my dad's name was Percy, as I said, and they were the sons of a gentleman called Johannes Hoff, who had come from um, Holland in the, in the uh, 1880s and married um, Florence Nunn, who was my grandmother. The, uh, the, where we lived in South Africa was uh, very difficult. There were no schools. And so we had to go away from a very young age. At six years old, I was sent to a boarding school uh, almost near Durban. And uh, that is where we were taught by Catholic nuns. Uh, it was a very strict school. The nuns were, <laughs> were very cruel to us, to be honest. And it, uh, it took some uh, tenacity to survive uh, that experience. Uh, it's here that I learned one of the, what I consider one of my key strengths, and that's a sense of responsibility. And that was brought about because when we were eight years old, we had to learn to take care of a younger boy. And um, so a six-year-old uh, would be in my control, and I would have to make sure that he was properly dressed, shoes were cleaned, uniform was ironed, hair was brushed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it was quite a load on, on young people like us, but I think that it, it made a lasting impact and developed a sense of responsibility to me. I've been in business most of my life, uh, and so really what I want to do is, is give you a bit of a story about just my life growing up and what the racial system that was manifest in South Africa did to us. Um, this is the second school that I went to, which was a middle school, Sydenham Primary School. And the schools were segregated in South Africa because we had this system where there was a hierarchy, uh, a racial hierarchy that existed where black people uh, were basically restricted to being laborers and, and, and low-cost uh, employees. Uh, mainly because uh, when uh, gold and diamonds were discovered, the South African infrastructure was that they had to remove a lot of ore to be able to get to even an ounce of gold. And so it was imperative that the uh, 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 low, low cost labor was maintained at all times. So this was the place of the black people. Uh, in between them, we had a variety of separate racial groups. So it's not as simple as it is here where it's just black and white. It's quite divided. And so we had Indians who were people from India. We had Asians who were basically Chinese and Japanese and any people from sort of South Asia. Um, we had uh, coloreds, which were mixed race people like myself, and then we had a group of people called Cape coloreds, uh, who were derived from the people that came in, a mixture of people, Africans, Indians, Malaysians, etc., who came in as slaves to the Cape Colony in the early days. And then there was a, there was a group where if they couldn't quite find a label for you, 
you were slotted into this group and that was called other colored. So Sydenham Primary School that you see here was a colored school. And um, this is where I learned to protect myself in many ways because when I came to join the school, I was dubbed a farmer, I was picked upon, and what is called bullying in the modern day was rife. I mean, nobody even paid much attention to it. You just had to find a way to deal with things yourself. And so um, the, 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 uh, the principal of the school uh, had set up a, a boxing gym. He used to be an Olympic boxer and he had set up a gym uh, in, in, the, in the school. And whenever there was a dispute between two people, they would be taken to the gym at lunchtime, put the gloves on and sort it out in the gym. Uh, so that's one way I learned to protect myself because I found out that I had quick reflexes, I was quite fast, and I inadvertently became quite a good boxer. Uh, and that earned me a lot of respect and I started to move up the, the ladder, uh, the social ladder at school and I was less picked on. In fact, some of the people that I, I beat in the boxing thing uh, became friends for life and very close to each other. So what I learned in Sydenham School was really learning to protect myself in many ways, as I said, uh, not only using my body, but being able to use my words and being able to use my wit. And so, and laughing at myself was also uh, quite a, uh, an interesting way of getting around uh, the bullying factor. After uh, Sydenham, I moved to a school called Beche, which was a high school. Uh, but it was an interesting high school because at the top end of it, if you look at the le top left picture, uh, is a bunch of older people and they were training to be teachers. So that they were in the teaching college. So they didn't go to university for teaching degrees. They completed four years of teaching college. And so I grew up amongst uh, those people. And actually, because I could play soccer at a quite a good level, I actually intermingled with some of the older boys uh, playing soccer. Uh, the, the, the next picture, the bottom picture, is the uh, as beche as it is today, and it's become a high school now. It doesn't have the teaching college because that's become a university degree now. So um, beche was a great time for me. I, uh, I started to become politically aware, um, and so you know we would do things like try and disrupt the singing of the national anthem, and so I found myself getting into a bit of trouble. Um, I also found that my athletic uh, abilities came into, into play and I found myself on a provincial uh, track and field team for the high schools and uh, actually ended up winning 100 meters, uh, 100 yards in those days um, at the championship in Cape Town at a place called Greenpoint Stadium, which is still there today. Uh, so it was a good time. The sports uh, was a good way to... Uh, to uh, integrate socially with uh, different team members. Uh, I also actually worked really hard. I would get up every morning at three or four o'clock and, and go to the track and get my workouts in every single day. Uh, so I put in a lot of hard work and I think that also helped me develop the, a bit of character that would help me in business uh, in being able to stick to the hard work when the time was, when it was required. Um, I also did uh, played a bit of, of, uh, of cricket and soccer, a little bit of rugby, not much. Um, but the main thing was that it was sort of a coming out period of finding ourselves. And, uh, and there were a group of us that really saw so much injustice in the, in the racial system that we were starting to find ways to, to uh, go against it. One of the things that really came to our attention was that a massacre in 1960 where the police killed more than 69 people. And the reason for this was that the, uh, the, the native South Africans, the black South Africans, had to carry what they called a passbook, which is a kind of identity document, and they had to have it on them at all times. And they really hated this. They did not want to do it. And so they gathered at a place called Sharpville near Johannesburg, and uh, they put their passbooks into a big pile and set them alight. And the authorities, of course, didn't like that and came in and, and fired on them and killed many of them, as you can see. So really a sad day for the history of South Africa. Uh, they found out that over 700 bullets had been fired by the police against unarmed people uh, that were just standing around there. 
the apartheid system, as I, I moved and grew, um, I moved out to, uh, to um, my dad's place. My dad got sick, and as I finished high school, uh, I needed to help with the business. And this is where I really got exposed to apartheid and legalized racism. South Africa had probably the most laws of any country in the world, and a lot of them were, were dealing with racism. Uh, so you can see a couple of pictures here. The top one, a beach, excuse me, a beach where only white people are allowed. Uh, the second one, a sign that says, beware of natives. Uh, and a, th a third one, again, the city of Durban, a beach for white people only. So this was what we ran into every day. If we needed to go to the post office, we had to go into the non-white side. If we needed to uh, go to a store, we probably had to go to a different side. Restaurants, of course, we couldn't even get into. Uh, and just a, a litany of, of, of laws that, that were really difficult to deal with and really demeaning. And I started to find that my sense of confidence and self-belief was being affected. Um, occupational segregation was one of the, one of the laws that had a, a, a big impact on me and my business. Uh, because what I found was that after my dad got better and I needed to go and look for a job for myself, I was blocked in so many different areas of interest. Uh, I remember wanting to get into advertising and being told that I couldn't. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do was get into uh, a diesel engine repair type of work and the same thing. And it's interesting to see that uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of white kids were raised by black people, as you can see on the bench here but the lady has to sit on the other side of the bench, which is so ridiculous. And this was the same thing if there were walkways over highways, uh, those bridges that go across the top over, over roads, uh, there were two sides to those, one for whites, one for non-whites. And you can see a sign there that says, this lift, which is an elevator, this lift is for Europeans only. Uh, so we had to go around and walk sometimes upstairs to get into buildings. During this time, uh, what started happening was that uh, many people started leaving the country. Uh, and you can see the, the, the uh, news article that says 900 doctors, teachers, and nurses have emigrated to Canada in the last four years. So we experienced a huge brain drain, and a lot of our good teachers left as well. And this affected the, uh, the education system. So the education for non-white people was getting lower and lower. And I think this was part of a, uh, a planned policy to try and uh, keep uh, the non-white people uneducated, thinking that they would be easier to manage. My dad on the right side um, became an activist and uh, became a counselor in what was called the Council for Colored Affairs, which is much like the Department of Indian Affairs that exists in Canada. And um, he was very respected amongst our people and fought really hard. And I think what I learned from him was tenacity and the ability to stand up for yourself uh, when things aren't right. And this still is with me today. And, you know, it, it's, I find that it, uh, if people are trying to push me around or whatever, I have this resilience that I think I learned from him. So a lot of uh, fighting back took place at that time. And, and as I said, people were starting to leave the country in droves. In the meantime, I had started a few little businesses. Uh, the very first business, I was only about 10 years old, was growing cabbage. And uh, my dad allowed me to do this and, and put it, sell it in the store. And the lesson I learned from that business was that one day I was rude to my mom and uh, my dad <laughs> took away everything I had, all the money I had saved, stopped me from planting the cabbage and so on. So I learned a very important lesson about respect. Um, after being at, at my dad's business in South Africa, I moved to Swaziland for a while. Uh, and my dad bought a nice home there and we emigrated essentially from South Africa. I got into a business of selling cement blocks, making and selling cement blocks, uh, concrete cement blocks, which was a, a very lucrative business and I did quite well at that. I was only 18 or 19 years old at the time. Uh, after a while, I decided to sell that and uh, I decided to go look for a, a different job and salesmanship interested me. So I worked for a company called Irvin & Johnson uh, selling frozen foods, mostly fish uh, that came off the waters off of Cape Town. 
Um, I soon found out that the white people that were doing the same job were getting commission, and I wasn't getting a commission. In fact, I was getting a very low wage, and despite making several attempts to, uh, to try and talk people into giving me more money, I wasn't successful. So I left that, and that's when I found out that a gentleman uh, called Chris North, running a small business, needed somebody to work in his diesel fuel shop, which you see on the right-hand side of the picture. And he, um, he tried to hire me, but was told that he couldn't because of the uh, Job Restriction Act. So uh, what he did is help me apply for an exemption. And it took a long time, but we got an exemption, so I became the first ever um, non-white person to be able to work in this industry. Shortly after I got qualified, I did an apprenticeship in the fuel injection business. And shortly after getting qualified in that, I moved uh, to Durban uh, to work in a much bigger shop than this uh, to gain experience. And once that had happened, I uh, then moved on to a small town called Coxstead um, in, in the southeast of the country and started a company called Fuel Injection Services, uh, which I was later, to sell before, uh, later able to sell before coming to Canada. So that was my entry into the, um, into the diesel fuel injection business, uh, which became quite a good business for me. Um, we, uh, one, one lesson that I learned from that business in Coxstead was that um, don't sell yourself cheap. I went in really cheap. I was doing everything cheap, and people got the impression that it was uh, not being done properly. And I learned the positioning lesson very well, positioning and pricing the product properly so that people understood that the perception was that they were getting a high-quality product. While we were in Coxted, uh, this terrible event took place. Uh, the black children in Johannesburg uh, were being forced to learn Afrikaans, which is a, a, a language similar to Dutch, and they considered it the language of the oppressor. And they would, were very unhappy about having to do this, so they organized peaceful protests. And uh, on June the 16th of 1976, uh, the children decided that they were going to march from a high school in Soweto in Johannesburg to a soccer stadium uh, in protest. And a young man called... Um, uh, Hector Peterson was one of the first to walk out of the school and onto the sidewalk, and he was almost immediately taken down by a police bullet. Uh, here you see uh, a young man uh, carrying him, running to find an ambulance, and his sister by his, uh, Hector's sister by his side, uh, uh, obviously distraught. Uh, Hector was to die. I, I don't think he made it to the hospital. And so this was a really terrible incident, but um, the, the, the man that was carrying him, uh, to show you how bad the oppression was, the man that was carrying him was a young boy at the time, he was 16 or 17, I think, uh, was threatened so much uh, and, and harassed so much that he left South Africa, disappeared in that year, and has never been heard of since. There was news at one time that he might have been in a, in a prison in Toronto on immigration charges, but there's still no definitive word that it is him uh, because he had changed his name and was so scared of being found. The, the gentleman that took the picture was a guy called Sam Nzima. And uh, what he did was immediately that he took the picture, he went back to the office of his newspaper and got the picture out to the rest of the world. And that had a major influence in turning the rest of the world against South Africa, which was followed by sanctions and, and um, uh, basically be, uh, South Africa became a pariah after that. Uh, Sam and Zima was also harassed and, and thrown into jail and, and threatened with death and so on. So not a good time at all for South Africa. But this was something that had an impression upon ourselves, uh, me and my family about uh, my parents had immigrated to Canada at that time, and we were seriously thinking about moving to Canada. Um, a little while later, we, uh, we in fact, uh, I did with uh, two of the children, traveled to Canada to visit my mom for Christmas. Uh, and on the way back, uh, a couple of things happened then and, and shortly after that made us make our minds up to get out of South Africa. And that was um, on the way back, um, we were traveling from the airport in Durban to our home, which was about two and a half hours away. 
and I was sleeping in the back of the vehicle with the two kids and suddenly realized that the vehicle wasn't traveling anymore and we had actually been stopped at a police roadblock. Um, as I woke up, the policeman approached me and asked what I, who I was, what I was doing, and I explained to him that I'd been out of the country, asked for my passport, uh, had a look at it and said, oh, you're one of those communists, which was a catch-all for when they wanted to arrest you or, or do something of that nature, they would call you a communist. So um, I was taken, severely beat in front of my children, uh, who were screaming and distraught. They were only six and seven years old at the time, uh, and uh, also shot at. I don't know if, uh, if uh, it was just a warning shot fired or whether he really tried to shoot me and miss, but I was shot at as well. Uh, and um, uh, finally, we were released after we were taken. We were in, in a cell for a while, and then I managed to talk to the uh, top policeman at the, at the uh, precinct, precinct and uh, he eventually released me. A short while after that, uh, we had a, a, a maid that used to look after the children. And uh, at lunchtime, we used to go back home and see that everything was all right and have something to eat. And this particular day, we went back and we found that uh, the children were playing on the street just in underwear and there was nobody in the house. And uh, the, the maid in the house next door uh, came out hiding behind the building sort of thing and, and told us that the police had come and arrested the maid. And the reason she was arrested was because she had forgotten her passbook, which is what you see on the right-hand side, and which is what the people in, um, in Sharpsville had been burning. And uh, because she didn't have it with her, she'd forgotten it at home, they arrested her and left our kids on their own. And for me, that was the point where we decided that we were gonna leave South Africa and get out. Uh, so we decided to find a place in Canada, and uh, on the left you see our family shortly after arrival in Canada. Jill was about eight years old, Percy Jr. was uh, seven, and Rudy was four, three or four years old. Um, on the right-hand side later, after we, uh, we uh, settled in Canada, uh, life was really good for us. We first settled in Sutherland which was almost like a separate town at that time. <laughs> you had to basically go out of Saskatoon to get to Sutherland. But uh, it was a horrendous time for the economy in Canada. Um, interest rates were about 17%, so we bought a very small house. Uh, in fact, we used to joke that we had to go outside to change our minds. And, but we, after about a, a, a year of, uh, of working for a company in Sutherland, um, I went to a Christmas party with the staff, and one of the salespeople had decided that uh, he had had enough because the company had put us on work sharing uh, because there were so many layoffs in the company, and we were getting two or three days pay a week, and you know we were all finding it tough to live. So um, I talked with the salesman, and we got together a couple of days after the Christmas party and resolved to uh, get out of, uh, of the company and start a new business. So we started what we called at the time Saskatoon Diesel Services, which was up in the north end on Miners Avenue. Uh, it, the current location is the picture you see now, which is on 29th Street East. Uh, and I also started a, uh, um, a soccer company um, where I started teaching children how to play soccer, and it was very successful. Uh, I've sold that off as well now. Uh, but we had a, a very good start. The expertise that I had developed in South Africa was little known here, uh, and we found a way to reduce fuel economy because that was a major issue way back in, uh, in South Africa when the United Nations had placed oil embargoes. Uh, fuel fuel uh, economy became a major issue, and I had a method to uh, drastically reduce uh, fuel economy on farm equipment, and so the business really grew rapidly. It grew at the rate of about 25% a year. Um, after five years or so, uh, my partner decided to leave, so I bought him out and changed the name of the company to DSG Power Systems, which it is now. In the meantime, in South Africa, things were coming to a head. Uh, you can see the peaceful protests, uh, but they were scary, peaceful protests uh, on the left-hand side. Massive protests and, and acti activists uh, were all over the show. 
and uh, it came to the point that um, that uh, civil war was imminent. And at that point, Nelson Mandela, who had been in jail for some 25 years at that point, uh, was asked to speak to the nation. And miraculously, he went on television and spoke to the nation and calmed everybody down. And I think that was the point where the South African government realized that they had to give up on apartheid and, um, and release Man Nelson Mandela, which happened, and he won the presidency uh, shortly out of coming out of South Africa. So South Africa is a much different country now. Uh, all the racial laws are gone, and Mandela's dream of a uh, rainbow nation, as he called it, where everybody was free and everybody was uh, a useful citizen to the country and didn't matter what color you were, was his ideal. It's uh, sort of coming to that, but uh, there's still work to be done. Uh, I took my son back to South Africa uh, Percy Jr. to South Africa after 25 years away, I would call it sort of self-exile. Uh, we decided to go back and one of the most stirring moments for me was following the whole history of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and you can see now the, 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 the monument they've got to the new South Africa uh, says democracy, reconciliation, diversity, and responsibility. And just by chance those were some of my personal values uh, and that's why I left South Africa, because I believe so much in the equality of man. And we talked about uh, responsibility, talked about the strength of diversity, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. At the bottom picture, uh, Percy Jr. standing in front of a house. This was a house where Nelson Mandela and the other Afri African National Congress, ANC, members were disguised as farm workers. It was actually owned by... Uh, a, a white gentleman who had sympathy for the cause. And these guys would uh, hang out in coveralls and uh, pretend to be farm workers until one day Nelson Mandela needed dental work and went into, went into town to get the dental work done. And it's believed that the dentist gave them up. So the security police arrived and arrested several of them. And that was the beginning of Nelson Mandela's 27 years in political um, jail. The picture on the right, uh, I don't have to tell you what those things are for, but they existed and many political uh, prisoners were subject to whatever happened in that gallery. So uh, a happy ending and a, and a sad history for South Africa, uh, but I, I became really emotional when I went through the Apartheid Museum, uh, which is where those nooses are. Uh, and, uh, and also visiting the actual place where Mandela was arrested was very, very interesting to me. So talking about lessons learned, uh, one of the greatest lessons learned <laughs> for me was um, from this guy who is a soccer coach. His name is Lothair Osianda. Lothair was a uh, um, coach of the um, United States men's soccer team at the Barcelona Olympics. And I attended a workshop once, and uh, one of his topics that he talked about was the, di the strength of diversity in, a, in his soccer team. And he said when he had arrived, he's German national, when he had arrived in the U.S., the U.S. national teams consisted of high-level uh, um, university, Ivy League-type university players, uh, all white. And he said that when they traveled the world, uh, there was this diversity gap where people wouldn't know how to behave, they wouldn't know how to act, etc. And when he got there, he started bringing in people of different races into the team, and he found how they all looked at, after each other in certain situations that they were more comfortable in. For example, if they went to an ambassador's house, the Ivy League boys would you know, direct and, and help the others out. And if they walked through a tough neighborhood somewhere, somebody that had been grown up in that situation would be able to come to the forefront and say, hey, don't make eye contact or just keep walking or something to that effect. So that really stuck with me because I believe that diversity brings strength to organizations and we should embrace diversity and, and different cultures. Um, the other thing that I've learned over the years is that, and this one might strike you as strange, but I've almost given up on formal uh, performance appraisals. 
Uh, it might work where, you know, the HR department in a big company uh, keeps files, et cetera, et cetera. But basically what I found over the years is that just a mentoring week by week, day by day, and, and, a, and a, a nice sit down that's not formal at all seems to resolve things. It, it gets people to be less nervous, more receptive to talking. And, uh, and we, one time we used to do what they called 360 reviews, and that would be collecting information from other workers and then presenting it uh, to, to the staff member that was involved. And that was a very difficult thing for me uh, because I found that people immediately became defensive. So that's one thing that I've got in my business now is we, we do performance appraisals every day, bit by bit. Um, not being an inward-looking organization, uh, even today, some of the admin people at, at my business uh, think about themselves first. So put policies in place that work well for us, but they, they don't work well for the customers. And so going back to what I learned from my dad is the customer always comes first. And so we should try to make our businesses operate in a way uh, that puts the customer first. Uh, relationships, happy people ring cash registers was what a, photo comp a photocopying company in the States used to say. That was their motto. And so try to keep people happy. Try to have uh, good social interaction at work. Um, but mostly show them, uh, even when you got to have a hard conversation, have it in a way that, uh, that doesn't make them look as though they're totally useless. Uh, hire character and train the skills. Uh, there used to be a company in town here that made um, farm equipment called FlexiCoil. And uh, I went in there to learn about uh, quality control. And this is something that I stole from the manager of the place at the time. And basically, he wanted to hire the attitude and didn't worry about the skills because those could be taught later. That has really served me well uh, in my business. Um, be vigilant. Watch your numbers and surprise people, because if they know you fall into a routine, you know, I've caught somebody stealing uh, from me in the past, and uh, just by doing random checks on different things, uh, you keep people a little bit off balance, and so they don't get into, uh, into a routine of uh, being so comfortable that they can start uh, doing things like stealing. Um, know yourself and remind yourself and surround yourself with good people. Um, I went to a leadership call, a course for 10 days at the um, uh, university uh, in London, Ontario. And um, that was the first thing we did on the very first day with some people from the psychology department. We sat down and, and did an analysis of our personalities and characters. And uh, we went from there. And the whole emphasis of the course was that uh, you can't lead if you don't know yourself. Um, I've also tell you what I took from them as well was wherever you find you, when you examine yourself, you find that you have gaps either in your personality or your knowledge and find the right people to fill those gaps and uh, you'll have a successful business. And the biggest one of all, I think, is never hold grudges. I have no animosity about what happened in South Africa. I, I employ white South Africans now uh, and have ever since I got here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think those are life experiences. They're tough, uh, but we take them and we move on. Um, I want to thank you at this point for uh, joining me in this talk.